And good morning, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to have a, a material supply here. Your uh, scope threes are very much um, in our purview and um, something that we have to worry about every day. Um, so here today, I'm going to give you a quick overview of what earth friendly concrete is, but I'm going to try to give it from a point of view of the, the challenges that we've faced along the way to, to perhaps give the audience a bit of a perspective of someone trying to bring a new product to market. And we've heard about the big three, you know, cement asphalt. or concrete, yeah. perhaps <laughs> asphalt and steel. Um, they're big challenges. They're very big challenges. So I'll try to, I'll, I'll try to give you a bit of, a, as I talk about the product, I'll tell you about the issues we face over the way. Um, we'll go to the next slide, thanks. So, so first of all, what is it? So we are simply taking the cement out of concrete. Cement is the key ingredient in concrete. So, um, you know, it's not a small challenge. What are we replacing it with? Well, basically the mix is the same other than that cement. So a typical mix of concrete would have somewhere between 300 and 400 kilograms of powder going in, fine grey powder. Uh, instead of it being cement and ash here in Brisbane, cement and slag in the UK, uh, we are using slag and ash slag being uh, waste from steel production, ash being waste from coal fired power stations. Same water, same aggregates, all local materials. Um, everything else is the same. Next slide, please. So, cement, so just to talk about cement, it's the big ticket item in concrete. Um, so, I'm a civil structural engineer, I'm definitely not a chemist. So, this uh, has really been challenging for me. Um, but in essence, we're taking limestone out of the ground. We're putting it, we're heating it up to 1,200, 1,500 degrees in order to take carbon dioxide out of that limestone. We're going to take CO2 out of the rock. Um, so that, and you can see in the bottom line there, calcium carbonate going to calcium oxide and CO2. So we're actually going to take the CO2 out of the limestone to make it. That's not so clear. Effectively, which we then grind, make that great powder. Uh, so the biggest thing we can do for concrete is to remove the cement. And AST 600, the Australian standard for concrete, says that concrete has a binder and that binder shall be Portland type cement. That is effectively the one line of AST 600 that EFC does not comply with. So it's inherent to the process. So it's a struggle. Next slide, Max. Um, when we take that cement out, we get a big drop. So you know, it's the key part. Uh, it's obviously the key part of concrete that holds it all together, but it's also the biggest, um, has the highest carbon intensity. Uh, so, you know, and we've been looking at Wagner's does it, and the whole concrete industry has been reducing the amount of cement using more and more what we call supplementary cementitious materials, slag and ash and other things, and that's great. Um, our approach has been to try to remove cement altogether. We, we have found a way to do it, and that has been our real driver uh, since 2007, when I was lucky enough to be there for the first test tube uh, that we did. And for my sins, I'm now looking after this, uh, this <laughs> development company inside Wagons. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we have found and, and what kept it going, well, perhaps I could talk about what initiated it. So think of Think back to sort of 2007, we were talking carbon tax here in Australia. Um, Wagner's had initiated a cement grinding mill at the time. Um, and so you know, it was a pretty bold move to walk into the boardroom and say, maybe we're not going to use cement in the future. Um, but what we found pretty quickly was higher in, in numerous applications, better performance characteristics. Uh, and so that led us to find not only um, carbon benefits, but technical benefits. And the sort of what we're really looking for today are where those overlap, the intersection of where we find a technical benefit can add some value. Um, so very quickly, I'm not sure if there's too many, if the engineers are in the audience today, but higher flexural tensile strength, low shrinkage, so that's always an issue uh, with concrete. Uh, much better acid resistance, we, we, it doesn't have calcium in the structural backbone of the concrete. That's what gets attacked by acids in wastewater, for example. 
um, and better in marine applications. Uh, the final one there, low heat of reaction, when concrete cures, it, gets, it gives off heat. And when we do mass concrete footings for buildings, for example, or wind turbine foundations, uh, which Wagner does a lot of, we have to manage that heat. Um, a geopolymer concrete has a very low heat of reaction and suddenly that's not an issue anymore. So there's lots of benefits. So we're really looking for where those benefits overlap with that drive for carbon reduction. Um, from a commercial point of view, that's what we're looking for. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm not sure if the video is going to play, but uh, if the operator could click the slide, maybe it's not. But oh well, we'll get it. We'll get it uh, slightly pixelated. That's okay. Um, just to show you, it's great and it goes hard. You know, and you know, we actually had a customer in the UK say to us, "This this is uh, on the south coast of the UK, so we're making the chemical activators um, in uh, a place called Romford in the northeast of London, and we're supplying through multiple concrete plants now in the UK." Um, the comment, the quote was, the remarkable thing about this concrete is it's not that remarkable. Right? <laughs> and my response was, well, that's 15 years of R&D that's made that. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, a long, it's a long haul. This concrete is batched 40 minutes away from the site, uh, driven to site, put through a 50-metre boom pump and then placed by uh, a team. This is one of their first goes at it. Uh, so, yeah, it doesn't look any different. That's the That's the... The result of a lot of hard work uh, over many, many years. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the big things, and a lot of these have already been touched on today, but and this this will go for any new product, but I'll talk specifically about about uh, concrete um, specification. So you know, AS, we don't comply with AC, ASC six hundred because our binder is not poor type cement, right? Um, Typically, a lot of our specifications in Australia are performance based. We say we want concrete of a certain strength. We want to have a certain shrinkage. We want to, and all of these components are used by design engineers to design structures. Um, we have all of that test data now. We've placed about 70,000 cubic metres over that time period, but it's not in the standard. So it's hard for an engineer to put his house on the line, his insurance on the line. That's what it comes down to. You know, how do we know it's okay? How do I tell a judge it's okay? Um, in, in the worst case scenario, or how do I tell a judge I did the right thing at the time? Um, we have got uh, approvals in Germany. They have got a process through the DIBT, is the German Institute for Construction Materials, basically translated. Um, they have a process of approval for new products. Uh, so we've been able to go through that process. It has taken a long time, but we've gone through that process. Um, here, whilst we've got Great, great buy-in from transport and main roads and, and trials over, over time. Um, we are only approved at the moment for precast items with up to a 50-year design life. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a risk-based approach. Uh, it, it's difficult for the, those in, you know, the engineers responsible in main roads. You know, it's a product that they haven't necessarily learned about at university and they don't have 30 years experience and they haven't seen it. So how do they assess it? Um, and so this is, with, with new materials coming in, I see that, um, you know, one of the real issues will be trusting those, working out how to trust those that have developed the new product. How do we, how do we use it? How do we get it into specifications? How does, you know, pr to, for, for many, many years, um, since 1824, when Portland Cement was painted, you know, we've had PhD, thousands of PhDs a year coming out of universities on cement. Um, now, we haven't got that on geopolymer concrete, and there's going to be this risk-based approach that needs to be implemented to, to manage uh, these new products, regardless of what they are. Uh, in Australia, on a happy note, uh, technical spec 199 will be it's effectively an addendum to AS3600 is hopefully due for release in the next few months. Um, we're part of that committee. Uh, and uh, hopefully that will be out before Christmas. Um, we have had, as I go on the slide there, the, the Eastern Busway 2011 uh, Rocky Point boat ramp uh, precast panels. Yeah, we're starting small. Uh, it's important to start small. That's how you can manage risk. Um, I think that one of my issues that I'll that I'll bring up is not enough small stuff happens. 
quite frankly. You know, we, we've got Len Lease and Langer Rourke in the room who gave us a bit of a wrap before. You know, they're great. We're looking at the reality is they've got big projects. They want thousands and thousands of cubic metres of concrete. And that's great. That's where we want to get to. It'd be nice to do 10 and then 100 and then 1,000 and then 10,000. You know, it's, it's how technologies develop and grow. Um, so I agree with the sentiment that's been placed a couple of times. Uh, I think Pamela said it. I think uh, the last two speakers have both said it, actually. But, uh, you know, we need to be able to use it in mega projects, but the small projects matter too. Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, so performance-based specifications. We, we need to talk about what we want. Um, we've seen in New South Wales, you know, maximum carbon um, for a cubic metre of cement on some recent projects, um, which is great. So, you know, we're, we're taking steps. Uh, I can talk about a couple of projects from the UK that we've seen. So the Lower Thames Crossing is a big tunnel that's coming up in the UK. Um, they've defined it as a pathfinder project on their way to net zero. So they've highlighted a major project, uh, a net zero project. They're going to have, or well, they're specifying um, no diesel or petrol powered equipment on the project. So imagine doing legacy way tunnel or cross river rail with no diesel, you know, all electric or all hydrogen. You know, what a statement. And this project's a couple of, it's a year or so away from what I understand is, you know, from companies tendering for it. It's a huge opportunity. Um, what they identified is that by the time the tunnel opens, you're not going to be able to buy a petrol or diesel powered new vehicle in the UK. So they have to start working towards it. It makes sense uh, at this high, this high level. Um, and I don't think it's settled upon yet, but what we're seeing is that contractors are going to have to prepare their quotes, prepare their carbon accounting for their design and add 70 pound a tonne to their tender price, that evaluation. So, so they're putting a number on it and that will drive whether it's, you know, how we value that value for money proposal on carbon or they're, they're setting a number and whether it's a real number, whether it's a cash number or whether it's an evaluation, tender evaluation number, um, you know, it, it's driving that same outcome. People are coming to us and asking us about earth money concrete because they want to get on those projects. HS2 is a similar thing where uh, with the, that's the rail line from London to Birmingham, the largest construction project in Europe at the moment. Uh, we've deployed about 2,000 odd cubic metres of concrete into that project. Um, and it's all been initially in temporary works, so non-structural temporary works for the first year. Um, and we've progressed to structural temporary works. And they've had, we've done lots and lots of testing along the way. We're repeating testing that Waggers has done, but the client's doing it for their own, you know, for their own knowledge and, and risk management. Uh, and that uh, will then be used to go into permanent structural works in the coming uh, months and years, long-term projects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Earth-friendly concrete produced in normal batch plants. Um, back to probably a bit more about the concrete. Uh, we put our, we supply our activator as a liquid to a standard batch plant, so we can roll it out. We, we are looking, it's not a Wagner's thing. We are, Wagner's making the chemical, but we are supplying it to other, other concrete plants in the UK at the moment and looking to do so here in Australia. Next slide, please. And we do have some great examples. So here in Brisbane, we've got the Global Change Institute building at the University of Queensland. This is uh, another 2011 project. So all the precast floor beams in this uh, building um, are geopolymer concrete, and you can walk in and look up and see them. They're an exposed concrete item, uh, showing off the, all of the benefits of the building. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, the Pink and Bar Wharf. So this is uh, down near the mouth of the Brisbane River. Uh, it's actually also got uh, FRP rebar inside it. So no, no carbon steel uh, actually in the uh, wharf deck. It's nine foot off the salt water. Why, why would you put carbon steel there? Um, so these large scale projects that we've done sort of highlight that the technology is ready, which we've talked about, um, and that there's really, we've got some other issues that we need to overcome. Next slide, please. Uh, we might skip through two slides. I've just got a handful of, of case studies, which I've talked about. 
So some of the challenges, sorry for the size, um, costs. So whilst we've installed about 70,000 cubic metres of concrete over 10 years, we're running at a 25 to 30% premium for standard grades of concrete, okay? So here we're talking house slabs and footpaths. We've seen that when the geopolymer concrete, you know, has a lot of advantages in the base model. So when we go to marine grade concrete, we've actually priced cheaper and not won the project because we didn't meet the spec. Um, so that's that chloride iron ingress in, in marine infrastructure. So we, we see a lot of opportunities. Um, the other things um, that we'd like to point out is recently, so to talk specifically about Queensland government, whilst we completely support all of the, the messaging from the Queensland government and we see that it's heading in the right direction, on the ground, you know, there's a gap at the moment between the messaging from the top through to actually implementation on the ground. So we've had a couple of Department of Health projects where EFC has been specified, allowed for, for the price, um, started to be used, first couple of pours done, and then taken off. Um, time pressure, not enough people, cost overruns. Uh, there wasn't uh, an increase in cost in the concrete. We held a cost for the project. It was other cost overruns. And we saw that the officers on the project, the administrators of the project, were looking to cut costs. So that's an easy one to take away. And to give you a picture, they saved about 20, 25 grand on a $5 million project. <laughs> So those little jobs are so critical to um, suppliers like us, you know, for me to get another, you know, 500 cubic metres out, particularly into a government job, that's huge value for me. It's huge value in talking to my board who are funding us. Um, and that regularity, so two things, regularity, so consistently winning work, um, and lots of those small jobs really help us. It's a, it's a huge benefit. Um, and interestingly, at the same, about two days, within two days of that happening, contractors quoting, and Pamela would like this, I think, contractors quoting a hospital in Moree rang up asking if they could use earth friendly concrete because the tender documents are written where they're really inspiring contractors to find innovation and find um, carbon reductions. So um, we've seen that these, the New South Wales documents, while well, Set photocopied and sent a copy of them saying, well, how can help me make this? Um, so it's driving contractors to look at it uh, and to treat it seriously. So um, that's, uh, yeah, that's basically what we're saying. Next slide, please. So the, the opportunity, my over time, Monica, you're going to wrap me up. Well, here's the opportunity. I, I know there's lots of talk about Olympics. Uh, so I thought I'd just raise the things that jobs and energy plan. They're talking about 2,700, 2,600 wind towers uh, between now and 2035. It's a huge, it's a huge program of, of work, of renewables. Um, and if we go to the next slide, please. Um, in that, there's a lot of concrete. So I just think that there's a huge opportunity with concrete and steel and everything. You know, it's a huge opportunity for them. So not just with the Olympics, but in, in these programs as well to roll out specifications and requirements to decarbonise. The materials are out there. 